late poet Kenneth Frost said he was chasing words in order. We're going to be talking with his widow, Carolyn Gellin, about their life together as poets. And that's next on What Are You Reading? Welcome to What Are You Reading? We are the celebrity talk show where the books are the celebrities. And with me uh, for this program is Carolyn Gellin, a poet from uh, Wilton, Maine. Welcome to What Are You Reading? Thank you, Bill. And uh, tell us a little bit about how you and Kenneth came to Maine. It's a great story. Kenneth and I loved living in New York City. We were lifetime New York City dwellers. Kenneth had taught at Columbia University in the New School. My sister and I were running a small art gallery on West 67th Street. Um, and we were so very happy there. But at a certain point, when our books started piling up and the apartment got too small for all our books, and we thought of a solitude in which we could read and write, we thought of Maine, and um, after reading an article about blueberry pickers in That's Western right. You said it Maine. was a newspaper article. Yes. About blueberry picking in Maine, and that was the turning point. It was That's the turning what got you point. Here. I came up on the plane and looked at two houses. We selected one. We moved up. And after six months of living uh, in that house, the ice storm of uh, 1998 occurred, and we had a house fire, and 2,000 books burned, all our city closed, and um, we uh, had to move to another house in Wilton, mm -hmm. and we're so happy there. And it turned out to be the best move we had ever made. Uh, it was very productive to um, read and write in um, the solitude that Maine provides. Well, I think that's why a lot of artists come to Maine. You have a chance to focus. It's a quieter, it's yes. a quieter place. Um, although I guess you can be inspired anywhere, even you know that's very in uh, Midtown Manhattan. Oh yes. But let's back up a little bit and talk a little bit about your life as a poet. What uh, attracted you to poetry? I always loved poetry. I always loved words. I always loved to read. Um, I, I wrote some poems in school, and I won the first prize in the New York City High School Poetry oh, wow. Contest, and um, kept on reading and writing. And then when I met Kenneth, who was teaching, and very brilliant. Mm -hmm. um, he, he focused me on um, my work and how to develop it uh, in a very gentle, uh, fun way. Mm -hmm. He made it very pleasant for me to learn all that he had to teach me. Uh, and so, um, I learned how to uh, read and critique his poems, mm -hmm. and he read mine, and so we worked together. So you had a life, a life together of poetry. Yes, we did. Mm -hmm. And particularly when you moved to Maine. Oh, yes, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. What would be the difference between Kenneth's writing and your writing? Did you have similar interests, or did you have... Uh, diverse uh, 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 interests. We had very similar interests. We um, we had a deep interest in literature in general, in uh, religion, mm -hmm. philosophy, history, painting, music. We had a very wide uh, spectrum of interests. And then when you sit down to write a poem, you kind of put them to, you forget them, you forget all the craft that you've learned, 
and you focus on something very deep that wants to be said that mm -hmm. turns out to be a surprise to you mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. um, it can be triggered by a word um, or a phrase. Uh, Kenneth would sit at his desk and perhaps look at the chickadee mm -hmm. and, and that would be something. But then it could be something much more mysterious too. Now when you're creating a poem, uh, how do you know when you have the finished product? When you're saying you're looking for the, something that's very deep that's going to come out, when do you know that it's finally arrived in its final form? That's a very wonderful question because um, when, when Kenneth and I were writing, uh, I would be upstairs and he would be at his desk downstairs. And I would come down at four o'clock feeling that perhaps I had exceeded myself, that I was really uh, um, taking a giant step forward. And um, it didn't always work out that way. Mm -hmm. We were um, very honest with each other, but kind. Yes. Um, and um, y you let a poem sit for a while. You might try it out on a few friends. And uh, over time, you learn whether it has, whether it's clicked together like mm -hmm. a Chinese box, mm -hmm. uh, and if it has its life in it. Um, and uh, you may see that a revision is called for, um, or that you want to discard it, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or that you really believe in it. Now, uh, Kenneth's book of poems, one of his books, is Time on Its Own. Yes, that one just came out yes. end of October. Okay, uh, tell me a little bit about what, I, if I'm going to sit down and, and, and look through that, what, what, what kind of poems am I going to run into? Well, this is a book that I put together for Kenneth. I mm -hmm. knew exactly which poems he believed in. Um, and so uh, I put this together. Uh, there are poems in here. Um, we start off with a fairy in the sunset. And then we go on to a narwhal, a poem about a figure skater, which mm -hmm. I'll read to you later, mm -hmm. two tarantulas, a uh, dreamer, which was about a turkey vulture mm -hmm. uh, that he was looking at. From so he pretty much you would both draw upon what was around you. Yes, we did. And also what we had spoken about, what we were reading. Uh, when we were in New York, we went to the uh, museums a lot mm -hmm. and the paintings. We have a lot of art books also. Mm -hmm. And so everything feeds the sensibility. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I love the title of your book, For Alarm House. What does that mean? Well, that was... Um, that was how our house fire... I see, your first house. Yes, uh, was described by the fire department. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a four-alarm fire, and our house suffered the consequences. Uh, so I wrote a poem about that fire, and it informed other poems that I wrote. Um, and, um, yeah... Uh, I have poems in here um, from from New York mm -hmm. uh, uh, and from Alaska. And uh, when I was in New York, I was hit by a taxi on East 59th Street, and uh, my pelvis was crushed and sprang open. And so I have a couple of poems that refer to that in a in an elliptical way. Um, and then a poem from uh, Peru, uh, the Nazca Lines, or a pet shop in New York City, like now, do that. You, do you have a quota? Do you try to do a poem a day, a poem a week? Do you, you know, just when, when you're moved to create? I work every day in one way or another. How, how long do you write? When you're, oh, uh, that can vary if it's, if I usually take longer than Kenneth did. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when it came to him, he, he worked, he, he got right in and worked fast, uh, although he might revise later on. Uh, it takes me longer. 
and um, last Monday, I worked compulsively until 1.30 in the morning, and uh, then I didn't have it all in place, but then the next morning, I thought I solved solved it. Mm -hmm. um, now, we'll see. I'll let that sit for a while. I showed it to a couple of friends. One person loved it. Another person wasn't sure. Mm -hmm. So we'll see. And I, I'm reading it every day to see how it goes. I look over old drafts. I keep copious notebooks mm -hmm. and um, read a lot of books. And um, I try to write as often as I can. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and before we go to break, I just also want to mention uh, Kenneth's other book, uh, Night Flight. This was the first book that we put together. And um, Kenneth did see this book before he passed away. Mm -hmm. um, some people said that uh, a New Yorker had come to Maine to uh, render the loneliness of Maine. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm very fond of this book. As, as when Kenneth passed away, I wanted to be sure it had its chance. Mm -hmm. And so I went around the state here. I went down and visited my sister in New York and read it there. Mm -hmm. Went down to North Carolina where our publisher, mm -hmm. Main Street Rag, is located. Yes and uh, read down there. So I'm uh, not only reading and writing, but I'm out there reading them too. Right. And, and both of Kenneth's and mine. And keeping, keeping the relationship going yes. by the fact of so, what you're doing this. Oh, yes. Yeah, oh, that's yes. great. I have two more volumes planned for Kenneth, at least, but I have them set. And um, my new work. <laughs> so it's a busy life. You're watching What Are You Reading? We are the celebrity talk show where the books are the celebrities, and this time we're talking a lot about poetry with our guest, Carolyn Gellin, who is reading poems, or will be reading poems, from both her own and her husband, her late husband, Kenneth Frost. Yes. So what do you have for us first, Carolyn? I'm going to read Kenneth's poems first. Uh, the, this one is from his book, Night Flight, which was published in 2010. Coring the Moon. The full moon has a hole in it, right in the center. If you look closely, you can see a long tunnel and dark creatures traveling through it. Then they drop out of sight. Do they fall into a trap, a black hole, or nothing? Coyotes run in circles, mad for the nothing of the moon. They try on their ghosts in the moon's dressing room. Owls become raucous and tear their spirits limb from limb. The hole passes with a long howl. And men and raccoons and deer come out of the woods. Moonstruck. Share with us a little bit of what you feel from that poem. Well, this is how we felt about a night in Maine under the full moon. And I love the sounds in this poem, coyotes, moon, owls, hole, howl. Mm -hmm. And I, I love the, mis the mystery mm -hmm. in this poem. Mm -hmm. It's a great poem. Uh, please share a couple of more, maybe, from that book, or whatever, like to, whatever you'd like to do next. I, I thought I'd go to Time on Its Own, okay. which was just published in October 2012, and um, I might return to Night Flight. Um, this is Kenneth reading... Uh, this is Kenneth uh, listening to jazz. Um... He had an uncanny way of uh, rendering um, the nuances of an experience like listening to, say, Sidney Bechet or Charlie Parker. Mm -hmm. I could almost hear, say, Lady Day in this poem. He floats out 
in the hollow notes of the wind instrument till the rooms around him wander and a strange tree of dreams takes root on every windowsill. Very nice. I, I love it too. Kenneth's poems are very, uh, many are very brief. Yes, they are. I'll read one that's a little longer, The Figure Skater. But uh, yes, he liked to get to the pith of it uh, and not to have any extra mm -hmm. words at all. Mm -hmm. This one's about me. Suddenly, there you are in the electric eternity of a dream. Who shall I tell them you are? with your long hair, embodied light. And I'll read the figure skater. Like the headlight on a freight train stirring its witch's broth of wheels down double-barreled rails, faster, faster, looming on, homing on the heroine, bound in her straight jacket of ropes. The figure skater, wound in her star-spangled spin, flashing a spool of zodiacs, dances how many angels on the steel-tipped infinity of her skate blades, while her esprit woos the fortune a dust bowl remembers in whirlwinds till a star leaps out of the coils of gravity. Escapading on the mirror's altar, she swings into exploding mercury that bends and scatters apparitions just holding on to Godspeed with the rich glaze of her smile. There certainly is a lot of energy, a lot of yes. kinetic energy yes. uh, in that poem. And the form and pace of that poem render the speed and the star-spangled spin of the figure skater mm -hmm. and the words her esprit and that she's escapating on the mirror's altar mm -hmm. holding on mm -hmm. to God's speed. Another thing to point out about a, a, a poem like this and really all of them but this is a complex poem to read mm -hmm. um, Kenneth's poems are dense but they're they're easy to read because his metrics are very secure. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I can be carried along on his metrics even as I have to concentrate hard on all the But it words. makes the ride enjoyable. Yes. It makes the ride enjoyable. Yes, so it's it a good, does. it's a, you know, poetry is such a, a work of wordsmith, of wordsmithing. Yes, know. it is. Okay. Well, let's hear some of yours. I have a poem here called Duet with Gabriel uh, for Louis Armstrong. And well, that's a good follow-up to the jazz one we heard just a little while ago. <laughs> well, Kenneth told me these two stories about Louis Armstrong, that when he was playing a, a, a command performance for the King of England, he gestured up to the royal box, this one's for you, Rex, and uh, later on, touchingly, when he got old and sick, and um, the doctor told him that he shouldn't play his mm. horn anymore, he said, I gotta play my horn, Doc. When I die, I'm gonna play a duet with Gabriel. Mm -hmm. He loves his horn the way I do. Mm -hmm. A man has got to have something he can die for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote a poem about that. He finds the rhythm, a grape seed dancing in a glass of champagne. He plays a duet with Gabriel. This one's for you, Rex. Exaltation of the air, sunshine ransacks shining ground. Each note gets rich on the next. Mm, very nice. And I have another one here. Forgotten. The bones of the dead sparkle deeper and deeper into darkness. Sometimes a sleeper rises bones clothed in a sort of lantern and stands at the edge of life. Very and nice, delicate uh, poetry. Thank you. Nice. Thank you. 
Um, and again, this book is, this is from your book, uh, Four, Four Alarm, Alarm House, House. Yes. Okay. Uh, which came out uh, in February of 2012. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite poets is the German poet Friedrich Hodelin, whose dates were 1770 to 1843. He said he was struck by Apollo, and I believe him. I think of him as the modern-day Pindar because he's a poet of praise. Mm -hmm. um, he sees the world as blazing with the presence of God, or he can render um, a very painful um, experience of the withdrawal of God from the world. He, he had mental troubles, and he lived in the care of a carpenter and his wife and family in a mm -hmm. small village in Germany for most of his life. Holderlin. I have thoughts whose witnesses are ready to be put to death. There must be no sleeping during that time. My lamp, a fakir, drones hollow music to my black, radiant skull. I am interested in desperation. I float and fly in it. The clouds are casual coffins. The boatman rips their bellies open and drinks tears. He cannot enter my house. There is no outside to it, as my left hand cannot cover my right without moving out of space. I am inside listening. The song in the wind changes its tone in every tree. White ravens sink through the stars, dress and undress the silence. I sit in the open spaces of my heart, crumble a handful of words. Very nice. Very nice and very, uh, very delicate. And uh, it, you really, it seems like you and Kenneth really benefited from the move. From we Manhattan certainly did. To Maine. Yes. We carried New York with us to Maine, but Maine had a tremendous impact on our inner landscape. Mm -hmm. It certainly mm -hmm. did. Perhaps as we uh, move towards uh, the close of the program, you could share one more. Uh, I would poem? love to do okay. that. Uh, perhaps I will read to you um, a poem that Kenneth wrote very late. Um, in life. The End of Day is the title of the poem. And the end of day came to Kenneth, and I thought he had written in a very profound way about that. Mm -hmm. um, upside down, spiders weave evening air. Ave, ave. I fall into light that slips out of the room. Furniture and books secrete the end of day, exiling themselves in my silence. The shining outlasts its day till I cannot remember. Shining Thanks so much for sharing such wonderful imagery with us. Uh, it's always a delight when we do a program on uh, poetry. You uh, have been listening to Carolyn Gellin and, uh, and by her late husband, uh, Kenneth, Kenneth Frost, and uh, their poetry. Thanks so much again for being on the program. Thank you, Bill. And you have been watching What Are You Reading? <laughs> <laughs>